You see, when you ask the question, does HIV cause AIDS? The question is, does a virus cause a syndrome? How does a virus cause a syndrome? It can't. It really, truly, it's necessary, I've been saying to the honorable members, to the people in this country, it's necessary for people to study this question. Mbeki sparked controversy this week when he repeated his stance that a virus, which is what HIV is, cannot cause a syndrome, which is how AIDS is identified. During his term as president, Thabo Mbeki became infamous for his strident AIDS denialism. This guided the country's policy on the illness. In 1999, when Mbeki took office, he appointed Manto Chabalala Mzimang to the position of health minister. She was to hold this position until 2008, the year in which Mbeki's presidency ended. Notoriously, Chabalala Mzimang promoted garlic, beetroot and lemon juice to treat AIDS, amongst other things. This led to her nickname, Dr. Beetroot. The consequences of the government's policies on HIV and AIDS were nothing short of catastrophic. Over 330,000 people died prematurely from HIV and AIDS between 2000 and 2005 alone, and at least 35,000 babies were born with easily preventable HIV infections. It is impossible to begin to fathom the amount of suffering of those who had the illness and those who lost loved ones. This is a dark stain on South Africa's young democratic history. AIDS denialism wasn't just limited to Thabo Mbeki. Because he was the president of the ANC and the president of the country and because the ANC was the party of liberation, he succeeded in creating enormously widespread confusion about HIV. You know, the country was debating, does HIV cause AIDS? Ordinary people were phoning into radio stations saying, HIV doesn't cause AIDS, ARVs are toxic and poisonous. I'm Cecilia Cock and this is Landmark Judgments, a show about South Africa's major constitutional court cases. This series is brought to you by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. So we feel that we've come to the point where legal action to try to enforce the rights of doctors to prescribe nevirapine, of pregnant women to receive nevirapine, rights to dignity and a range of other rights has become inevitable and that is why this morning the pa papers have been filed with the Pretoria High Court. Well, I'm afraid we've reached a stage where morally myself and the 200 and other 50 pediatricians around the country who have signed this particular action believe that it's morally our responsibility to be active. We refuse to remain silent any longer because children's lives matter. This episode is about the Minister of Health and Others versus Treatment Action Campaign case. This case was the first major breakthrough in forcing President Thabo Mbeki's government to change its irrational policy on HIV and AIDS. The court held that the government was constitutionally required to provide antiretrovirals to pregnant HIV-positive mothers to stop mother-to-trial transmission of the virus. It was a groundbreaking case, and its impact was fundamentally life-changing for millions of South Africans. Today we have in studio with us advocate Gilbert Marcus, who has played an enormous role in the development of South African constitutional law, and in fact, in law in various other fields as well. Thank you so much for being with us today, Gilbert. Thank you for inviting me. The TAC case really seems like the quintessential case of law responding to a moral and political crisis. It is an example of strategic litigation at its absolute best, and of sort of social activism being expressed in law. Can you just give us a little bit about the background to the whole case? I mean, it was run at a, at a time where emotions were heightened around uh, Mbeki's AIDS denialism. Um, there, there was a serious crisis going on and you, know, you needed to pick a way of getting involved um, and, and your ta tactics in this case are particularly mm. interesting. Can you just tell us how the case came about um, and, and the years that went into uh, 
you know, bringing it to its ultimate fruition. Certainly, I, I, I think you're correct that it is a, an interesting example of how the law responds to a social and moral crisis. Um, I think in retrospect, it's the sort of case which ought never to have gone to court, ought never to have had to go to court, because if there had been sanity prevailing in political circles at the time, it wouldn't have been necessary. But the background is very simply this, is that the AIDS pandemic had struck South Africa with a vengeance uh, in 2000 official statistics emanating from the Department of Health suggested that some 5 million South Africans were living with HIV. Uh, and that was effectively a death sentence. But it was the beginning of the emergence of antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and it certainly held out hope for those living with HIV that there was a way in which, at the very least, uh, their lives could be prolonged. And the Treatment Action Campaign, as its name suggests, was formed in late 1998. And its ultimate ambition was to ensure that everyone living with HIV uh, could be provided with antiretroviral therapy. Um, the problem was how to go about this. And they had a massive ongoing engagement with government. Uh, their campaigns targeted the pharmaceutical companies to try and ensure that the prices of these uh, drugs came down. They were prohibitively expensive. And they reached a point in about 2000 where the government seemed absolutely intransigent. And they took the decision to go to court. The question was, what case do you bring? Mm. First prize would have been to compel the government to provide antiretroviral drugs to everyone living with HIV. The problem was that those drugs were so expensive and the regimen for their administration was so complex that that was simply impossible. Uh, and they realized it, and no court was going to compel the government to do something which at that stage was prohibitively expensive and virtually impossible of implementation. So the question was, well, what are the alternatives? There was one alternative which was discussed, which uh, was certainly a compelling case, and that was the provision of antiretrovirals for the survivors of rape. But for obvious reasons, no clinical trial could ever be conducted to determine their efficacy. And the last possibility was to provide antiretrovirals to pregnant HIV-positive mothers because one of the most prevalent methods of transmission of HIV was from mother to child at or around the time of birth. And that seemed like a, a, a candidate for a legal challenge. At the time, there was a drug called AZT. Uh, its name was Zyduvudine, I think, known as AZ, AZT. Um, but it too was expensive, and its administration was also complicated. However, there was a clinical trial being conducted in Uganda called the HIVNET 012 trial, which was a trial looking at the effects of a drug called nevirapine to prevent mother-to-child transmission uh, of HIV. And those results were looking extremely encouraging. The huge advantage of nevirapine was twofold. First, it was relatively inexpensive. It cost approximately uh, 10 rand for a dose to mother and child. And its administration was uncomplicated. Uh, the mother would take a pill when she went, one pill when she went into labor, and the child would be administered a uh, certain a number of drops, depending on the weight of the child, upon the birth of the child. It was as easy as that to administer. It didn't require the kind of monitoring and uh, 
constant uh, checking of blood tests and the like, uh, which accompanied uh, other similar drugs. The problem was that nevirapine was not registered by the Medicines Control Council. Medicines Control Council is the regulatory body through which all medicines have to be registered. When a medicine is registered by the Medicines Control Council, they give it, as it were, a stamp of approval. They, uh, they do so because they are satisfied that the drug in question is safe, effective, and of, and of acceptable quality. And one of the huge dilemmas was, well, what do we do in the absence of a registration of nevirapine? There was a possibility of going to courts without the registration of nevirapine because the legislation permitted what, what is called off-label use. But it's, it was considered to be an exceptional procedure, and we were very unsure, in fact, reasonably convinced that no court was going to compel the state to uh, provide an off-label drug. Mm -hmm. um, and so we took a decision, a difficult decision, I need to add, to wait until nevirapine was registered. It was an excruciating decision for the very simple reason that, um, that babies were dying. It's, there's no other way to put it. There's no other way to put lipstick on the pig babies were dying, and the delay meant that more babies would die. Um, so as soon as nevirapine was registered, the treatment action campaign moved. They wrote a letter of demand to the, uh, the Minister of Health and to all the provincial MECs for health, uh, demanding the provision of nevirapine at all public hospitals to all uh, pregnant HIV-positive uh, women. And that was really the beginning of the case. Uh, the state's response was bizarre, to say the least. They recognized the efficacy of nevirapine, as they more or less had to. But they said, we are going to only confine its availability to two sites per province. So the simple reality was this, that if a mother... HIV-positive mother uh, was about to give birth and she was unable to access one of the two sites in the province, she would not be given nevirapine. And the blunt reality, and this was established by the evidence that was led, is that the, her child would almost certainly be born HIV-positive. Those children had a life expectancy with roughly an outer limit of five years. And in that period, they would suffer the most excruciating and chronic uh, ailments, which would be ultimately fatal, including meningitis, uh, diarrhea, septicemia, uh, every sort of opportunistic infection that you could imagine. So it was only once nevirapine was registered that we decided to launch, and that's exactly what we did. At that point, um, the World Health Organization had also already uh, you know, condoned the drug and, and um, verified its efficacy and uh, declared it for um, you know, use uh, for such cases. Um, so it's only later on did the Medicines Control Council um, then also register. And then how did you, how did you personally get involved in the case? Um, how was it that the treatment action campaign um, and you teamed up? Um, I suppose it goes back a while. Um, I, I spent uh, eight years at the Center for Applied Legal Studies at a time when the AIDS Law Project was uh, formed by Edwin Cameron. And the treatment action campaign was an offshoot uh, of the AIDS law project. So I, I knew the main players uh, in the treatment action campaign. I'd actually done some work for them in other matters. Uh, and I was approached by Zaki Ahmad and Mark Haywood to do the case. Um, and of, of course, I agreed to do so. But 
to get back to your opening comment, the case came at a time when no lesser person than the president, President Mbeki, had seemingly embraced the dissident cause. That's the shorthand for those who denied the link between HIV and AIDS despite the overwhelming body of scientific research throughout the world. And so there was an extraordinary reluctance to embrace antiretroviral therapy at all, let alone in the context of mother-to-child transmission. And the president made a number of critical speeches in which doubt was cast over antiretroviral therapy. The then Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Chabalala Msimang, uh, followed suit. And so you had this rear guard action uh, of having to uh, try and persuade the government and then ultimately a court to do something to which the leadership in government was apparently strongly opposed to. So it was a to use a word which was much bandied about at the time, the drugs were la labeled as toxic, but what was truly toxic was the absence of political will. That obviously also throws <coughs> up the issue of separation of powers. Yes. Can you just tell us a little bit about how the court dealt with it and how you dealt with it in argument? <coughs> Whenever... Whenever government action is challenged, uh, the state normally cries separation of powers. Uh, we, we have seen it many times, and no doubt we will see it many times in, in the future. It's, it goes back to really what was intended by including socioeconomic rights in the Constitution in the first place. That was not a matter which was out without controversy. Uh, there were those who argued that um, socioeconomic rights like access to health care facilities, uh, access to education uh, and the like were, were, were really quintessentially matters of government policy and there was little or no room for legal intervention in that sphere. The drafters of our constitution were very alive to that debate and they adopted a formula which sought to, to marry those two competing concerns. And so they, they enacted a range of socioeconomic rights, including the right of access to health care, uh, among others, uh, and they imposed an obligation on the state to progressively realize that right uh, adopting reasonable measures and within available resources. So the very formulation of the constitutional right embodied within it a balancing process. And when the text of the final constitution was finally uh, approved by the constitutional court as it had to in terms of the mechanism which had been adopted, um, the Constitutional Court made it clear that the debate about whether or not these rights were justiciable was, uh, was an academic debate. The drafters of the Constitution had decided otherwise, and the courts therefore had a proper role to play in policing the enforcement of socioeconomic rights. And um, the, the TAC case was actually only the third socioeconomic rights case which reached the constitutional court. But the debate about the role of the court uh, was one which I would suggest had, had previously been settled. Of course, the state in its opposition to the TAC sought to put a spin on, on the separation of powers and, and the, the rallying cry which I heard many times in court and out of court for that matter was it's intolerable to allow unelected judges mm. to prescribe medicines from the bench. Now, that was complete nonsense. Nevirapine was the state's drug of choice. Uh, the drug had been registered by the Medicines Control Council, so its safety and efficacy uh, were beyond debate. And the real question was the, the rationality of this 
limited program that the state had decided to adopt. Uh, the bizarreness of the program was how they selected these two sites per province. Let me give you an example. Uh, in Gauteng, the Johannesburg Hospital, which was arguably uh, the most important hospital in the province, one which was entirely geared up to the administration of Navarapine because it had been doing similar work in the antiretroviral field, which had provision for testing uh, whether somebody was HIV positive or not, which had set up uh, facilities for counseling people before and after testing took place. The Johannesburg Hospital was not one of the designated sites. So the question really was, was this a rational response uh, to, to a problem, and could it possibly be justified? To use the language of the Constitution, could it be said that this very limited access to a life-saving drug uh, was a rational response or a reasonable response to the obligation on the state to provide access to healthcare services. How did the state go about arguing its case? The state adopted what I can only describe as a schizophrenic argument because one of the specters that they raised over and over and over again was that antiretrovirals in general and nevirapine in particular was a toxic drug. Now, these are very, very powerful drugs. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and, of course, their administration has to be uh, monitored. Um, but it made no sense in the context of the state already having chosen that it would be available at two sites per province, uh, but not elsewhere. So the state could hardly be heard to say, this drug is dangerous and toxic yet, we are going to allow it to be administered at two sites per province. So it was an internally contradictory argument. There were other arguments they advanced, and that was uh, that related to the question of breastfeeding, because the research suggested that um, one of the ways in which HIV is transmitted, or or one of the factors which might lessen the impact of nevirapine was by breastfeeding. And there was a concern expressed, and I don't suggest that this was an illegitimate concern, that the package of treatment which was provided ought to include the provision of formula feed, and that might be difficult in rural areas where there isn't clean water. But of course, that was, that was an argument, argument which says, well, we can't deliver a perfect product, therefore we're going to deliver very little at all. So that too was uh, hardly a, uh, a persuasive argument. What was interesting, and it was something we feared, but which ultimately didn't materialize, was that the state would advance the, the denialist uh, theories uh, about HIV uh, and AIDS. So we we, we put up a, a great deal of evidence on the science of HIV and how it is transmitted and how it is treated, uh, anticipating that the state would say, no, there is a contrary view. Uh, that didn't materialize, interestingly enough. It was amazing because mm. through this extremely targeted intervention, mm. you were able to get the state to acknowledge science, I guess. That's well, Cecilia, I, I, I perhaps am slightly hesit hesitant in saying we were able to get the state to acknowledge science. I, I think that the high watermark uh, was that they didn't dispute it. But I suppose that that probably amounts to the same thing. That there's an implicit recognition. Of there was an implicit recognition yeah, because yeah. they didn't dispute the science. I can tell you, at the 11th hour, and uh, I really mean the 11th hour, the day before the hearing in the Constitutional Court, there was an application by a dissident doctor to intervene as an amicus, as a friend of the court. And the basis of that intervention was to dispute the science from beginning to end. But it literally came the day before and the court said, you're too late. We're not going to entertain this. The, the elephant in the room, 
was that no less a personage than the president uh, had embraced the dissident cause and the minister uh, had followed suit and the the parsimonious program of limiting this incredibly cheap and easy to administer drug by confining it to two sites was clearly a manifestation of that uh, embrace of the dissident cause. Um, it didn't find its way onto the papers, but it didn't have to. Everybody knew that. I mean, judges, judges are part of the real world. They read newspapers. Uh, there probably cannot be a person in South Africa who doesn't know of somebody who at that time was, was living with HIV. Uh, the extent of, of the epidemic was so massive that it didn't have to be spoken, but it was manifested very clearly in the spurious uh, opposition which was advanced. And it, it wasn't only spurious, I should tell you. In, in some cases, it, it was nothing short of callous. Uh, and and I, I use the word advisedly. Uh, the treatment action campaign were highly, highly skilled uh, in, in mobilization. And they, they taught me several lessons, I should tell you, about public interest litigation. And they, we included in the papers a series of affidavits from a range of ordinary people simply describing their experience of the inability to access nevirapine. So, so one of the stories was told by a woman by the name of Sarah Shlalele, who happened to be uh, an activist in the treatment action campaign and was therefore very, very aware uh, of the issues and of the availability of nevirapine, and she was HIV positive and she was pregnant. And she carried around with her a dose of nevirapine for that eventuality. Uh, as fate would have it, she went into premature labor. And she couldn't access one of the uh, one of the one of the designated sites, and so she didn't get access to nevirapine. Uh, and both her child and she herself subsequently died. But we put up that story, and the response, which was written mainly by the Director General of Health, was to accuse her of being negligent about her own health and the health of her baby. I mean, that is a, a staggeringly callous response. They targeted doctors, doctors of conscience. So at the Johannesburg Hospital, which, as I mentioned earlier, was not one of the designated sites, uh, the head of pediatrics, and I want to mention him by name because he deserves recognition, was a doctor by the name of Peter Cooper. And the Johannesburg Hospital, amongst many others, was entirely ready and able to administer nevirapine. In fact, they received a donation of, of the drug from the Anglican Church. And when he administered nevirapine to, to pregnant HIV-positive uh, mothers, he was accused of, uh, of threatening to bring the health system into chaos and he was threatened with disciplinary action uh, for saving lives. Uh, one other doctor, a doctor by the name of Dr. Andrew Grant, who worked in a rural hospital in KwaZulu-Natal, similarly defied. He and his colleagues uh, uh, collected money from, uh, from each other and bought the drug themselves and administered it. And he too was threatened with disciplinary action. So it was a vindictive response. There's no doubt about that. The government also raised the issue of capacity, which was a strange issue given the way that um, the relief was sought. It was specifically sought where counselling um, facilities already existed. Yes. How did the government even bring such an argument? And also just to note, um, at, at the point at which you, know, you brought the case, it was... Also the case that nevirapine was offered for free to the government by the manufacturer of the drug correct. for a period of five years. That's for correct. For free. 
It was offered by Boringer Ingelheim, um, which was the manufacturer of Nevirapine, free of charge for five years, and it was refused. Um, the, the, the arguments around capacity were also spurious because um, we demonstrated conclusively that there were many, many sites outside the two designated per province uh, which had the requisite capacity. And, and as, as I've sought to emphasize, the administration of Nevirapine was absolutely straightforward. It entailed no, uh, no real expertise at all. The mother took one pill, the baby got a few drops. There were certainly capacity issues, potential capacity issues around uh, testing and counseling, but many, many, many uh, hospitals had that capacity. So it was a spurious argument. The other thing that started to happen is that uh, some of the provinces, I suppose, embarked upon what might be described as a campaign of defiance. The Western Cape, which at that stage was under, I can't remember, but it was not under ANC control, simply announced that they were going to go their own way and they actually uh, announced a, a, a timetable uh, which was aimed at getting 100% coverage in every clinic uh, and hospital in the Western Cape within a relatively short space of time. Uh, KwaZulu-Natal, which was then under IFP rule, uh, broke ranks as well. And importantly, in Gauteng, the premier at the time was Mbazima Shaloa, also uh, announced, no, they, they, they're expanding the program and they're also aiming for... Uh, 100% coverage. He was rebuked, uh, publicly made some form of retraction, but in fact simply went ahead. So, so even those who might otherwise have been thought to toe the political line just realized that this was an unsustainable act of madness. The, the state was ordered to implement uh, a Navirapine program they were ordered to uh, administer nevirapine uh, at those sites which had the necessary capacity to do so, where in the opinion of the, uh, the doctor in question, this was uh, medically advisable. Um, and so it was effect effectively an instruction to roll out uh, a national program to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Ultimately, uh, despite some quite severe foot dragging in some of the provinces just basically uh, defied the court order, uh, leading to an application to have the MEC for Health in Mpumalanga uh, put in prison for contempt of court. Um, that was settled when she backed down, or he backed down, I can't remember who it was. Um, but ultimately, the program got off the ground, and it was the beginning of one of the most ambitious projects in the world uh, for the treatment not simply of mother-to-child transmission, but of HIV generally. And so today, there are, I think, the, the numbers are more than 2 million HIV-positive uh, people who receive free treatment in the public sector the most extraordinary mm. case mm. where a legal victory really translates into you know mm. victory well results in the real mm. world no there's a huge debate about the extent to which uh, the law and particularly court cases can bring about social change um, i think that that debate is largely put to rest by this case uh, i'm not saying that other cases uh, necessarily achieve the same result or impact. But uh, for those who contend that legal victories in the courts are unable to effect social change, I think this demonstrates that that's not correct. Thank you for listening. I'm Cecilia Cock and this was an episode of Landmark Judgments, a show about South Africa's major constitutional court cases. This series is brought to you by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom.